Good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us for this webinar on how to vet a private placement with our special guest, Anthony Ornella. So in just a few minutes, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Anthony, but I do want to kind of give everybody an idea in case you don't know how a self-directed IRA works and especially when you're making those investments into things like private placements. I'm going to give you an idea of what else um, the other items that a self-directed IRA can hold or other investments that a self-directed IRA can make. And then after that, I'll introduce Anthony and he'll take over the webinar and he'll also be available to answer your questions. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, go ahead and just type them into the question box. I do keep the whole webinar muted just for the purpose of the audio being very clear so everybody can hear. Um, so go ahead and type any questions that you have into the question box and we'll get your questions answered as we go and then we'll take questions again at the end. And so we'll get started. Um, and again, I'm just gonna give you a really quick overview of self-directed IRAs and how they work. And so my name is Larissa Green. I'm with um, Advanta IRA. I have been doing um, presentations, networking, education, and sales with Advanta for about uh, a little over eight years now. And so um, my role here really is business development, but I work very largely with people on getting good education out there to our contacts and clients. And so that's what we're presenting to you today. Um, Advanta IRA is a self-directed IRA firm, meaning what we do is hold investments outside of the market. And so we're really just filling the gap in the industry for you know, those people who wanna invest and really diversify their portfolio. So Charles Schwab, Morgan Stanley, those are all really great companies and what they've sort of decided to do is not hold any private investments and that's where we come in. And we actually do the opposite. We don't hold anything market-based at all. We help you make those private investments that you would like to make. And from there, we do all the record keeping for those investments. And we have two offices, one in the Tampa Bay area of Florida, and then we're also in Atlanta, Georgia. But really, we can help anybody nationwide and even worldwide. So as long as you have a U.S.-based retirement account, you can self-direct it and we can help you with that. Something that we don't do, and we talk in our seminars a lot about the rules and the things you can and can't do within a self-directed IRA and who you can't do transactions with, but something that we actually don't do is give any legal tax or investment advice. And so if you're making an investment, it's gonna be up to you to do all of your due diligence, make sure you feel comfortable with that investment. And Anthony's gonna help us understand how to do some of that due diligence coming up here shortly. But the idea being that we're here to be the administrator on your IRA account if you have questions above and beyond that, and we can certainly direct you to those professionals that can help you with those questions. There's not a lot of companies out there that will hold private investments, and there's even less now, as a matter of fact. Um, it was that some brokerage firms would have held some private placements, some private stock, um, sometimes notes, depending on um, you know, their availability and capability of doing so, but they've really for the most part decided they're no longer going to do that with the change in the fiduciary laws a couple years back. We're really seeing that they're sort of asking those clients to find a new home for their private investments because they just don't want to be responsible for something that they kind of consider hard to value or administratively unfeasible. They don't want to pay expenses on behalf of an IRA or receive income that's not related to stock dividends and things of that nature. So that's really sort of where we come in. And there's not a lot of companies out there that will do it. And as a matter of fact, less than 2% of all IRA investments are truly self-directed. So a lot of times people say, well, I have a self-directed IRA. It's with you know E-Trade or Fidelity or Morgan Stanley. And they're idea of a self-directed account is much different than ours. So we consider something self-directed completely outside of the market. Truly, you find the investment, you come up with the terms, and you make that investment. And you know, a lot of the brokerage firms will offer an opportunity to trade um, based on what it is that you want to invest mostly in and when you want to trade, but they're still only offering you market-based assets. So that's sort of what makes it different um, from a truly self-directed IRA, or I should say our definition of a self-directed IRA. 
a lot of times people are under the misconception that your IRA has to be a Roth for it to be self-directed. And I'm not really sure where that comes from. But the truth is, if it ends in IRA, it can be self-directed. And of course, the most common types of accounts we see are going to be traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs. But outside of that, we see a lot of simple SEPs, even solo 401ks or one participant 401k plans. We also can hold education savings accounts and health savings accounts because the rules for self-directing those two are exactly the same. And so we can hold those as well. And then as well as any old employer plan. And I kind of put emphasis on old there because if you're currently employed and currently participating in, participating in a plan with your employer, typically they're not going to let you move any of those funds because they're paying fees. And of course, if they offer it to one employee, they have to allow all the employees for fairness. And so typically they're not going to allow it. Now, that being said, I have had clients have the ability to move funds while they're still currently employed. So it's always going to be up to the plan administrator as to whether or not they allow that. So if you're thinking about self-directing and you're, self, or, um, you're currently employed, just check with the plan administrator, maybe your HR department, and find out if they'll allow you to do what they call an in-service rollover to an IRA account so that you can make some private investments. So I always like to kind of go over a list of investments that we see um, on a regular basis here at Advan, and then also give you an idea of some of the more unique investments as well. And the purpose of this really is because the IRS hasn't given us a list of investments we can make. Instead, what they've done is given us the very short list of investments we can't make. And so this really gives you an idea of what we're seeing because the only two investments you can't make in a self-directed IRA are gonna be life insurance and collectibles. That's it. Outside of that, the sky is the limit. And trust me when I say our clients get very creative based on the fact that they have very few limitations on the types of investments with a self-directed IRA. So just keep that in mind as we're going through the webinar and maybe that will kind of bring up some questions that you might have about an investment idea that you have for your account. So real estate is gonna make up about 30% of the investments that we see here at Advana. And that doesn't mean that, um, you know, it's the only thing we handle because a lot of times people say, well, I know you're real estate based, but 30% is the largest percentage of any asset class here at Advana. So it is the largest, uh, most common investment we see on a daily basis. I usually talk to at least 10 people who would like to invest in real estate. And so, um, that is a, a lot of what we do here, but a lot of what we do here is private lending and private placements. And so we're really all over the board. Um, but just to give you an idea of the real estate types of assets that we see, we do see some commercial real estate. A lot of times that'll be through a syndication, but sometimes people will buy an office building or you know, a shopping plaza with their retirement account. Um, sometimes they'll partner into those investments. And it is possible to use debt when you're purchasing through an IRA, but that's another day, another seminar. Um, we do see people do rehabs and flips through their IRA account. And I like this example because it really sort of illustrates that there's no required minimum amount of time that you have to hold an investment within a self-directed IRA. So if I buy a property today and I find a buyer for it tomorrow, I can certainly go ahead and sell that property. And the important thing for you to know here is that the IRA does not pay capital gains. So it's not subject to short-term or long-term capital gains. It's tax at, taxed at ordinary income at the time of retirement when you take distributions depending on the type of account that you have. And so something like a rehab and a flip is perfectly fine for a self-directed IRA. It can be residential um, property of any kind, even if it was just, you know, a vacant lot waiting to be built on or farmland or really just about anything. It could be condos and duplexes. I have clients who are doing short term vacation rentals out of their IRA. So all of those things are permissible in a self-directed IRA. We also have paper assets and a lot of times people who like to invest in rental real estate, rental property outside of their IRA say, you know what? I don't want to worry about tenants, termites, and toilets in my IRA, so I'd rather lend money on other people's rentals. And so we see a lot of that as well. And the great thing about lending money from your IRA 
is that you get the opportunity to be the bank. So when you go to the bank and you ask them for a loan, they're going to look at certain criteria and they're going to say, okay, you're eligible for us to lend you X amount of dollars at this rate, take it or leave it. And so when you're the bank with your IRA, you get to do the exact same thing. And the great thing is you really get to sort of determine the rate at which your IRA is going to grow. So if you're only willing to uh, lend at 10% and two points or 8% and two points, whatever it might be, those are going to be completely between you and your borrower. And so then you know if you have a good borrower and they're making their regular payments that you're going to get 10% back to your IRA, for example. Um, I have up here tax liens. Yeah, I like this example because it really sort of illustrates that you don't have to have a lot of money in a self-directed IRA to make alternative investments. And sometimes people are just getting started and they're looking at, okay, what can I invest in? And actually, we just did a webinar on this last week, hundreds to thousands, um, talking about things like tax liens or lending money and wrap loans, things of that nature that only take a couple thousand dollars in an IRA to get started. I also have up here unsecured notes, and I think it's interesting because the IRS does not require that you have any security on a note in your IRA. And so if you wanna lend money unsecured, that's certainly gonna be up to you. And again, remember, we're not giving you investment advice. And so if you're comfortable with this investment, certainly it's something that you can do. Just you know, keeping in mind that you may wanna get an attorney involved if your borrower should fail to pay, how would you collect on that debt if it's unsecured? You know, there's more moving parts there. Um, we see debenture notes and option contracts, uh, assignments of, of contracts for real estate. I see a lot of joint venturing. So lending money to somebody who's maybe doing a rehab and not only getting some interest rate, but getting a portion of the upside upon the sale of the property. And then accounts receivable. And that would be something like collecting on bad debt, for example. And we've seen that in self-directed IRAs in the past. And this um, last slide of assets kind of goes over the more unique investments that we see in a self-directed IRA. And so that could be something like an LLC. And sometimes it's a more unique investment, but sometimes it's just simply for checkbook control. And that's another day, another seminar also. But you know, if you're looking to have what I sort of consider the ultimate control over your IRA account, you can do that by setting up a single member LLC for the purpose of the IRA. The IRA is the member, you can be the manager. And then from there, just by nature of that entity, you have a checking account and now have checkbook control so that you can make investments over coffee and a handshake if that's what you wanna do. I also have up here some more unique investments, um, things such as farm animals. And I know a lot of times people say, well, who, who would make that investment? And just keep in mind the idea behind a self-directed IRA is investing in what you know best. So if you know um, farmland and for, farm animals and you want to invest in cattle, you certainly can do that. And you know, especially for a cattle farmer, they might look at the market and say, well, I really just don't know anything about that or enough about that to feel comfortable, but I know cattle and so that's where I wanna be invested in. I have clients invested in cattle and ra cattle, racehorses, alpaca, hogs, so really all over the board. Um, I also um, have seen movie projects. We see precious metals on a regular basis, so that's holding uh, tangible gold and silver bars. We've seen a large um, format printers leased out, ATM machines leased out, so equipment leasing, foreign currency exchange and futures trading. Those are um, relatively normal in a self-directed retirement account. We, of course, have seen cryptocurrency. Uh, it, it's kind of leveled off a little bit, but I think at this time last year, we were seeing a lot more people interested. Private stock, pretty much of any kind. So that could be a local bank, a restaurant, a brewery, any of those things. And again, just simply because it's privately held, you're not going to find um, brokerage firms wanting to hold those assets because they can't update the value based on what they're being told the value is. And so they're really not comfortable with those assets. And so we see those a lot with self-directed IRAs. And then, of course, commodities and oil and gas. And that could be something as simple as oil and gas rights, for example. So those investments, again, can be very unique or something very normal and just not typical of an IRA. But here at Advana, pretty much everything is, the, the atypical is typical, I would say. 
I did see some questions pop up and I'll get to those in just a second. I'm going to run through my case study real quick. Um, but basically, oh, and one of the questions I did want to address right away was, will the uh, webinar be available later on? And the answer is yes. So we do record the session and we post it to our YouTube channel, but because you registered, you will also receive a copy of the recording directly to your inbox. And so you'll get that through email probably Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. Um, so just diving right into the case study here, I'm gonna talk about how a limited partnership works within a self-directed IRA, and it's actually very easy. So if you've ever made a private placement investment, then you already know it's really just a, a little bit of paperwork Instead of your personal information going onto that paperwork, it's going to be the, the self-directed IRA account. We're going to help you with that as your administrator. So in this example, Susan wants to make an investment. She has $120,000 in an old 401k into a limited partnership, so a private placement. And she decides to go forward with the investment after reviewing their limited partnership agreement. So again, remember that Advana isn't doing any due diligence or approving the investment. All we're looking to do is make sure that the IRA is um, properly being represented as the investor because a lot of times people sort of uh, miss the concept that they're not making the investment, it's actually their IRA. And the reason that's important is because the um, IRS, we need to demonstrate to the IRS that this investment is going to be tax deferred or tax for. Uh, tax deferred or tax free, depending on the type of IRA account that you have. And so that's what we're really looking for there. And so if Susan has any questions about the investment, she should definitely seek a professional that can answer those questions on the agreement, maybe get her attorney involved in reviewing those documents. But once she's reviewed the limited partnership agreement, she's going to go forward with the investment and she agrees to invest $100,000. So what are the steps there? Well, Susan is going to open and fund her IRA account with Advana. Basically, we help her get the account open. And then when it comes to something like an old 401k, she does have to initiate that request with her 401k plan administrator. If it was a, an IRA, we would actually help her transfer those funds. Once she found the investment, we're going to start reviewing the paperwork with her. And again, that's not to approve of the investment, but rather look for any places that we need to make sure the IRA is being properly represented, as well as the signature bars on behalf of the IRA, because it's not going to be Susan signing, it's going to be Advanta IRA. And so once we, we've made sure that the investment documents show all the proper titling, we will have Susan do two things for us. One, she's going to submit a form to us. It's our form, letting us know that basically the um, this is the investment she's making. This is where we're wiring funds. She wants the investment done on whatever date and the amount of the investment and who else we might be working with. So, you know, maybe the um, general partner of the limited partnership, or if we're also working with her attorney or whomever might be involved in the transaction, those people are gonna go on what we call a purchase authorization form. And then we're also gonna have Susan read and approve all of the documents, and that's very simple. It can be done through DocuSign, but we need Susan's permission basically to make this investment on her behalf, and that's important because we do not send any funds out of Advan on behalf of a client without their express permission. So that's very important to us. And so once Susan signs off and approves of everything, then we will go ahead and sign on behalf of her IRA and wire the funds to the general partner. Something again to keep in mind that the limited partner is the IRA and not Susan. And so I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. And then the investment is complete. So here is how we demonstrate the limited partner as the IRA, Advanta IRA for benefit of Susan Smith IRA number 1234. So that's going to go on all the documents in place of her personal name. It will be her IRA. And something I want to mention also sort of as a side note, if, if the investment is for accredited investors only, Susan is going to have to apply with the general partner and be approved as an accredited investor. And that um, questionnaire is filled out by Susan personally. But once we get to the investment documents, we're going to show her IRA as the investor. Um, Advanta IRA will receive all of the income for, from the partnership on behalf of the IRA and will deposit it to Susan's account. So it'll get deposited as income. She'll get an email notification when we receive income in, in the amount and when it was deposited and for what. And she can also check her statements online weekly, monthly, monthly. Um, and yearly on our platform. So it's very easy. If at any time there's a capital call of any kind 
for the partnership, it's met by the IRA, not Susan. So that's important too. You know, if there's any anticipated um, future need for capital by the limited partners, then Susan will want to keep in mind that she will either need to be eligible to make a contribution, roll more money over from her 401k, or transfer from another IRA. So that's just just some important information that you'll need when you're considering a private investment through a self-directed IRA. And so with that, I'm going to turn the um, the webinar over to Anthony. How are you doing today, Anthony? Larissa, I am doing great. It's happy to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away. And I just want to remind people, if you have questions, go ahead and get them in the question box and we'll get them answered as we go. Great. Well, I hope everyone's doing well. I appreciate everyone being here. And thanks to Larissa and the rest of the Advanta team for having me. Um, let's jump right in. She's she's done a, a great job introducing all of this and uh, how to vet the private placement investment. So I think it's important to understand a little bit of who I am in all of this stuff. So I'm, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm a fellow investor, just like you guys out there listening in. And I'm also a joker. You know, that's going to come into play here in a bit. But I think it's important to, to note. Um, you know, my role, my full-time job is to create financial strategies, and a lot of it is around cash flow. So when we when we start implementing these overall strategies, uh, finding and vetting and, and giving opportunities in the contractual wealth is a big piece of that. And so uh, me as a joker, I do get to run in, uh, I, I do make friends very easily, and I run in a lot of different circles, and I get pitched deals, quote-unquote, investments and opportunities all the time. And so today today is really about sharing some of my experiences, some of the knowledge that I've got, and, and hopefully a couple of laughs along the way. So let, let's jump into some of the some of the other important factors here. Why should you care? Why should why should any of this care? Why does due diligence matter? Well Robert Kiyosaki in his in his famous book, Rich Dad Poor Dad, says the risk is not in the investment, but the investor. You know, Larissa touched on it a little bit earlier, is your investor DNA, the things that you know, the things that you understand are so very important. And so when it comes to due diligence, business is driven by human emotion. You're going to know if you enjoy something, you're going to have a gut feeling that this is a good opportunity or not a good opportunity. This due diligence piece is just the follow-up. And as the investor, Due diligence is not, and this is a mindset piece here, due diligence is not a path to talk yourself out of an investment. It's just to check the boxes to make sure your gut feeling is confirmed as a go for the investment. And if there are syndicators out there, if there are people that are putting together private placements uh, as a provider of these investment opportunities, uh, some of this should be considered on your end. You can you can create a very robust offering for people and something that will help you stand out and make more money. So I guess the, the good place to start is what is a PPM, the Private Placement Memorandum. It could be for a single deal. It could be for, a, uh, for an entire company. But the PPM is just a standardized document. You can find samples of them all over. If you're familiar with uh, private investments, you've probably seen or read one of these things. And so from, from an investor standpoint, it's blah, 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 blah. It's a lot of legal jargon. It is, it is a way to protect the general partners from liability. It is important and it is a good official starting point for a private placement deal. And I would highly encourage you to send that to your legal advisor, send that to your legal team to have them review it and see if there's uh, any recourse or, or anything that you should be aware of before pursuing. So now you've been given a private placement memorandum to review. You know what the deal is about. You understand the asset and you like the return and you're ready to go. So it's a good deal, right? Not necessarily. Just because they have an official document that outlines their role and outlines your role and outlines your returns, it's not necessarily just a good deal. So the things that actually make the investment run, that's what we're going to talk about. And that's some of the more uh, efficient vetting or efficient due diligence aspects of these private placement deals. And here's a quick list. It's very concise from number one to number seven in order of priority. Let's jump in. 
So as far as the operators go, these are the person and or people that are making this deal happen. From Jim Collins' great book, From Good to Great, it's first who, then what. And again, you already understand the, the parameters of the investment at this point. Now you want to really dive into the most important aspect, and that is the people behind the deal. It is the most important factor because it will make or break it. If the What is your personal relationship to them? Uh, what is their background? Uh, who else do they have? Uh, who else do they have around them to help them? What's the resume look like? Is this a new endeavor for them? Is this uh, something after a failure or after a success? Are they riding a wave? Or are they trying to get back up on the board? Uh, understanding first the who behind the magic is so much more important than what the deal is or what the deal is offering or what the deal consists of. It is first the who and then the what. And so to dive in a little more deeper, it, there are a lot of syndicators out there. I know, I know real estate is a very popular aspect for self-directed accounts. The, the operators vary from young to, to older to a large board to uh, just a single person. And so what if you're approached by an individual that's got a seemingly good deal with good returns, but when you look into their resume, it's lacking? What else do they have with them? Human capital is a really big piece of all of this investing experience. And so does, the, does this young person have a board of directors? If it is a small startup company, if it is a, a new farmer looking to expand some land, who else are they bringing in around them that's been there and done that before? And, you know, another other piece is who else is invested in the deal? If you have someone bringing, oh, well, we have a couple of, New York Yankee baseball players invested. Well, those folks may just have a lot of money. They don't they're not necessarily seasoned investors. But hey, we have the uh, we have a branch of the Rothschilds family office investing with us. Okay, that's one of the richest, if not the richest family in America. They've got some savvy investing experience behind them. And so, who else is invested in the deal? Uh, who are the other operators that are backing them and offering support again when the resume is lacking? And I think a very overlooked aspect of this, and I, and I know he's been a, a guest speaker on this, uh, on the Advanta webinar before, is Dan Hanford is a great example of a GP that is a business person. Now, if you know who Dan Hanford is, he's a multifamily syndicator, and that is primarily what you will see him doing now. But the truth be told, he has chiropractic practices under his control. He's got medical facilities under his control. He's a business person. Are the GPs on the deal just real estate experts, just deal makers, or are they business people? And if they are business people, they'll have you can have more confidence in them that they will run the operation as a business. And that for the investor should offer a level of safety and a level of comfort to you. So, and I, and I can't press upon you enough, the operators are the deal breakers in any of this. If you cannot get past who is on the deal and who is, is working on this project, you should walk away from the investment. Moving on to number two is the asset. And again, it, we've already gotten a large list of what you can use your self-directed account for. Uh, but more importantly, how are the funds appropriated? The asset could be the gleaming gem and what they are offering in the private placement deal. But where are the monies going? Is it into the actual real estate or is it into the operational side? Is it into paying contractors to, to spruce up the joint? Is it a single deal or is it a set of deals? Is it actually a tangible asset? Is it a computer software or is it the actual facility that the cloud uh, storage facilities are, are held in? Uh, is it going into debt service and what is the, you know, what is the debt to, to investment ratio? Or is it going into a growth pattern? So is it is it a smaller company that's had some success and you're investing maybe second round seed funding and you're truly investing in the growth of the company? Okay. All of these will give you a level of risk or give you a level of downside protection, but understanding where your funds are actually being appropriated. Are they going to pay some of the salary of employees or the GPs? It's important to know. So fund appropriation is an aspect of asset that you should look into or at least ask the question 
And keep in mind, these are people that are putting these deals together. They should have answers for you and ask the questions. And sometimes it's hard to know the questions to ask, but that's why you have, you know, a team, um, you should have a team in place around you, whether it's through Advanta or, or somebody else. Number three is principal protection. There's a actor back in the black and white movie days. I'm more concerned with the return of my money than they return on my money. Love the quote because it's so true. Offering the level of comfort, knowing that your principal is protected somehow, uh, is vitally important um, as you're looking at a deal. And so this is not an exit strategy. And if you're familiar with syndications, it's typically a three to a seven year hold. Uh, you have a balloon payment on the back end when there's either a sale or a refinance. That is the exit strategy on the back end. That is not what I'm talking about. Again, going back to the operators, going back to the asset and where the funds are being appropriate, appropriated, your principal, how is it protected? What things do the GPs have in place? Is the debt greater than the investment that has been pooled and greater than the, the capital raise? Chances are, if it's a large scale that real estate endeavor, yes, the debt is larger than the investment pool, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing if the operator's in place and if the asset is true. Uh, is there a war chest? This is a concept that, again, as Larissa would say, another webinar, another time, uh, the war chest uh, for syndicators is a very underutilized, but very, very important aspect if there is a recession, if there is a downturn that maybe affects production, affects sales, affects rent roll, affects operational effectiveness, whatever it may be. Is there something in place where the, the partners or the operators in the deal have set aside some form of money to protect at least the underlying principal of their investors? You know, is it a promissory note? Is there really nothing back behind your principal except, hey, I pledge to give you this money because we're going to do great things? You know, something a little bit from my perspective and some of the experience that I've had here is, is there a broker involved? And more importantly, if there is, why is there a broker involved? Are you investing directly with the syndicator or the, the, the business or, or with the farm or with the oil and gas, or do you go through a broker? Uh, just asking, asking the question of why are you going through somebody else and not going direct uh, can, can shine some light into some areas for you. Uh, is the money brought in and is it immediately spent? Is it spent for growth? Is it spent for gain? Is it spent, spent for acquisition? Or is it held and used as leverage? Is it held in escrow for proof of funds? Is it immediately dumped into a, a piece of property and that turns into equity, which will grow substantially over the years? So asking the questions of, I understand now where my funds are going, but I want to know how it's protected. What kind of armor are you putting around my 50,000, my 100,000, my 200,000? Because I want my money back when the time comes. Now, after that is return protection. The hardest thing to prove, and, and frankly, when the, the word guarantee scares off a lot of other people. So the, the term preferred return is it softens the blow and equity shares and splits. Return protection is very difficult because this is one of those things that is not necessarily under control of you or the operators. But again, you've done your research on one, two, and three, the operators, the asset, and the principal protection. And so the protection on your return is really, at this point, shooting for the stars or trying to maximize your investment. You know, checking the market averages and, and what that means is if it's real estate, are they offering a 5% preferred return when the, the market average now is 8% or 9%? Why? Just asking the question of why. If they're offering far above market averages, again, ask why. It's not necessarily a bad thing or a dishonest thing. Just understanding their rationale as to why they're offering those, uh, those compared to the market averages. You know, where's the money being made? I think that question doesn't get asked enough. How? How are you making my interest on, on the money? Is it rent? Is it uh, appreciation? Is it uh, through through leverage? Is it through the sale of a product? Is it through uh, is it through the development of a product? Is it through increased capital your company is going to retain from R&D credits? You know, any of these are, or is it a combination of all of these? Any of those are, are viable options for the company or for the investment to make money. But as an investor, take your time and do your research and understand how they are planning to pay you and how they are planning to get paid themselves. And then when do you get it and why? 
why is it a one-year hold? Why is it a three-year hold? Why is it a seven-year hold? I've seen a deal before that just like this, and it was only five years. Why are you electing to go seven? And again, this is not a, a bad thing. It's not a mean thing to say. It's an important question to ask. And and when there is a recession, how is there any protection on my return? Or are you just happy to give me my money back at that point? So always asking the questions of, of why is there a difference between the market averages and your deal? How are you planning to make money? More importantly, how are you planning to pay me what, what you're saying you're going to pay me? And then when do I get it and why? Why are you wanting to hold it this long? Is there a rationale? And again, a savvy operator is going to have these questions lined up and they're going to have great, solid answers for you that are, of course, honest. Um, no and more. before you go on, Anthony, Absolutely. actually, we had another, uh, we had a question pop up here. How do you find those market averages? So you talked um, about sort of comparing what their rate of return is and something that would be considered market average for whatever it is that the fund would be investing. Do you have a good resource for kind of figuring out what market averages in your area for that type of investment might be? Uh, of course, it's a great question. It, that is a difficult one, and it depends. Uh, you know, I'm not running across a lot of uh, – cattle ranch lands deals and alpaca farms. So I would have to lean on my network. I would have to make a few phone calls. I would have to dive into some research and ask. I would lean on the network, my network of, of people that are involved with this. As far as different syndication deals, uh, that is just personal experience that, that I've, I have. You can find a lot of different uh, multifamily syndicating groups out there and just make some phone calls and, and ask, hey, do you have a deal going on right now? No? Well, what did your past deal go on? Is there a, a bank? No. Is there like a bank or a resource of, of all this information? Not necessarily. Um, you can look at uh, different real estate forecasting, uh, uh, you know, appreciation scales and appreciation forecasts and all those things. They're going to give you general terms. Uh, as far as the the value, but from deal to deal, the nature of a private deal or the nature of uh, the nature of a private investment, it is it is private, and sometimes the information on those things uh, is hard to find. But the more you're involved in it, and the more you're going back to your investor DNA, when you can really believe that you know the the technology industry, these startup companies are seeing a 30% return, and all you're offering me is a 5% return. If you know the tech industry and you understand the profit margins, uh, that would give you a leg up. And if you don't, I would, one, request that maybe you look into another industry or go find a subject matter expert in that industry that can maybe give you some guidance as far as, is this seem viable? Does this seem like uh, 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 an actual um, an actual realistic return? Um, so difficult question to answer. Is there a, just a bank of information? No, but there is a bank of people uh, that you can lean on to. So uh, asking around, making phone calls, Facebook messaging, sending emails, all of those things are going to be uh, your your way to find some of the market averages. Uh, I know from syndicated deals, the, the average is 8% preferred return with either a 70-30 split with uh, LPs and GPs. Uh, and then I've seen lower than that, and I've seen higher than that. Sometimes the the equity split uh, is higher because the preferred return is lower, and vice versa. Uh, it's it is based off of experiential, uh, just seeing deals and having them brought to my doorstep, and and trying to put these things together for people uh, that that I that I've seen myself. So I hope that answers your question uh, fully. But jumping back in. Um, Unfortunately, I lost the number. I believe we're at number six here with market risk. Uh, it's important to note that this is not controllable. This is this is an uncontrollable factor from anybody. Uh, now, you have gone step one, you have gone step two, you've gone step three through all of the 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 very very important crucial pieces of vetting of vetting the operators and vetting the deal. Um, so, just ask the question of why is the where is the deal? What physical location is the deal and why there? You know, if you're a small tech company in Atlanta and you're creating a calendar software, well, Calendly is right down the street from you. So why are you electing to go there? Why are you electing to do that deal there? Oh, we've partnered with them to expand. Okay, well, that's a good reason then. Or, oh, we didn't know Calendly existed. 
yikes, I think I'm going to go find somebody else to invest my money with. So asking the question of where is the deal? And this is very important for real estate. This is very important for oil and gas. You know, hey, we're drilling in um, in in uh, Maine. Ooh, maybe it's better in Texas. <laughs> so again, understanding their rationale for where the deal is and why it is there. Um, are there other players in, in the industry in that region? Who is your competition? If they cannot tell you their competition, that's a massive market risk. People that are bigger, people that are better. And if there is competition, what's their meaningful difference or what's their value play that they can really differentiate themselves and get you the return that they say they can? And I think it's important to mention the term recession resistant. Really, dude? I'm not a fan of this term because I think every asset, every asset is just a commodity. It will go up, it will go down, it will have success and it will have failures. Recession resistant is a misnomer when it comes to assets because the true recession resistance comes from the operators. It's because of their response to a recession or a market change or a market fluctuation that truly dictates whether the asset succeeds or fails. If it's a multifamily deal, what processes do they have in place when there is a potential mass exodus from their, their tenants? What do they do when they have a mass return of their tenants? As the market fluctuates, as income comes in and out, are they being true? Are they being consistent? Are they being sometimes creative with how they, one, protect your money and protect your return? So recession resistance does not come from the market or the asset. It comes from the people and the strategies they have in place. So, you know, even on a buyout, if they can't sell the property uh, at the value that they thought they were, that does not protect your return. If the banks aren't lending because of a recession, they can't refinance the property. And so what do they do? Do they have a contingency plan? And it's not the asset having the contingency plan. It is the operators. And so again, this is not a controllable factor. It can be, it's, this is the risk that we all fight against as investors. And so the best thing you can do is get the who, what, when, where, and why that you've already collected and then dive a little bit deeper into the actual market potential risks in their area and in their industry. Price point. Uh, this is something that's sometimes overlooked. People just understand that, oh, it's a $50,000 investment. Oh, it's a $100,000 investment. But you should ask why. Why is the minimum where you have it? I saw a I saw a multifamily deal that was fifty thousand dollars, and over here I see another one that looks almost identical, and it's a hundred thousand dollars. Why? What's the difference? You know, it, sometimes people enjoy the lower price point because they can do more. But what is the investor experience at the lower price point? If you can get into a deal at five thousand dollars. Now, it depends if you're going to be very active with that, like a, a tax lien or a lease option or some kind of hard money. That's a different situation. But when we're talking from an investor in an LP standpoint where your money is being pooled into a much bigger project, why do I only need $5,000 when I see another investment over here that's $100,000 to get through the door or $250,000 to get through the door? Asking the question of why there is the minimum they are. And just because it's lower doesn't necessarily mean it's better. Uh, the experience for an investor that's entering a higher price point is oftentimes a little more efficient and a little more professional. And it can be a telling sign when they open the door to $10,000 installments, they're going to have a lot more investors, so it's going to be less personal. Uh, they could be after more size. They, they could be after a larger pool of money versus the actual investors. Some in some operators really desire to have high quality investors backing their deal and will raise the minimums to reflect that. Now, and another important thing at this point, how, how is that money going to be taxed? It's always important. You know, taxes is one of the biggest wealth destroyers that's out there. And so understanding how your money is going to be taxed and, and I know being through a self-directed account, uh, you're going to be taxed on distributions when it comes time for, you know, in retirement and it's going to be taxed as ordinary income. But what happens to the tax advantages of certain assets that you're going to purchase or maybe tax credit available investments like oil and gas or land conservation or uh, movie industries? Certain, certain investments have tax credits that apply. 
uh, understanding the rules and regulations, and that's where the Advanta team can kind of give you some, potentially give you some advice in that front as to what it's going to look like when that money is coming back out to you. And uh, so it's always important. I always, I'm a big believer that you should pay taxes. I'm a military spouse. And so I got to live in a lot of cool places because people pay taxes, but uh, I don't think you should leave Uncle Sam a tip. So really always keep an eye on the taxes when it comes to, uh, when it comes to investing. And also on that, I did have a question pop up about UBIT or unrelated business income tax and how it works with a private placement. And, you know, for, for us at Advana, we really suggest you talk to your CPA about this because the answer is, it, is it's going to depend. It, you know, if there's debt on the investment through the fund, you could be exposed to the UBIT taxes. Um, but, you know, getting your CPA involved and even asking to speak to, you know, their tax professional about it, I think would be a good way to go because unfortunately there's no um, yes, it, yes or no answer for this. It's, it's always going to be it depends. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Larissa. And, and again, it, it drives back to you should really have a team around you. You know, there's only so much one person can do. And I'm not just talking about you as the investor. You've done the hard work. You've earned the money to invest. That's that's the hardest part of all of this. Now it's bringing and assembling the team around you, using the resources at Advanta and just having a self-directed gives you access, which is huge. Having a CPA that understands the investment realm. That's very important, not just a book balancer, but someone who understands the difference between income tax, capital gains, and, and all the different assets and how a self-directed account uh, operates. Very, very important, and thank you for bringing that, uh, bringing that up, Larissa. Mm -hmm. And so lastly, and, and I would say this one, this, this last one, number seven here, is so much more important for the producers. If you're out there, if you're listening and you're someone who's trying to structure a deal or structure an investment, this one is for you. What's going on when the investors aren't looking? Is there continual updates? I think this is a big differentiator between people that truly are professionals in the deal structure. And it's, is there a newsletter coming out with updates on a regular basis, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually? Am I sent photos? If it's a new construction project, am I given photos on how my money is actually working for me? Because I want to know. I want my money to work for me, but I'd like to see what it looks like. And so are, are, you, are there live stream events where people can jump on a go to meeting and ask questions and, and talk with the operators, get to know them, Q&A sessions, maybe quarterly or semi-annually, you know, People want to know, people want progress, people want statements. And if you can provide photos, I mean, that's free marketing. Maybe they're at a dinner party or they're out and they get a notification on their phone and they pull up these photos and they, they chuckle a little bit and show their family members, hey, you know, I was telling you we invested in that uh, self-storage deal. Take a look. These are the pictures. They just put the new paint on and, you know, they, they said they're they're opening up the the rent the rent the, the new renters right now so a lot of different great marketing techniques through this and it serves your clients serves your investors to the highest extreme and from the investor side ask the question is this something that you do regularly or without me asking do i have to ask for these things or do you not do it at all and i think if they're completely opposed to doing it yeah, you may be dealing with a semi, you know, less than professional individual. If they're open to the idea of it, it shows that they're a little creative. And if they already do it, and this is something they regularly do, you're dealing with a professional, you're dealing with someone who really cares about the investor experience. And that is important. Talk about repeat business. If you can see your money working for you, not just when you return the money, but the, the value that your money is providing out there, farmland, uh, oil and gas wells, um, solar farms, uh, movies, places where people live, places where people put their stuff when they downsize or their, <laughs> and all that th and all those type and all those types of things. It is a beautiful tool uh, to not only retain business but to make investors feel good about what they're doing. And uh, Larissa, I'm running low on time. Is that right? Yeah, you're fine. We have about 12 minutes. You're okay. All right. Good. I want to build in some time to field some of the questions um, that have come in. So I, I will make these. Uh, this Again, as Larissa said, this, this whole webinar is recorded. So you, you can go back and read this. A lot of information on these next three slides. This is some case studies. And, and trying to, again, 
just express the differences that, that they're going to come. Every deal is going to be different. Every deal is going to have their little nuances. And that's what these case studies were designed just to show you. So this was a flipping fund. This was a single operator. This was a professional house flipper in Chicago. Uh, he was the solo act. Right? He was in a one person shop. Now he did bring a team in to do some of the professional work and all that, but so he was the person that you were investing with. He was allocating the money to his team to create, uh, a, you know, to flip a home and to make, create profit. Single family homes on the south side of Chicago, um, the investors play the investors pay closing costs and then half of the down payment. So 10% down plus closing costs that bought you into the deal with a return of 50% of whatever the profits were on the backside. And the timeline, roughly three to eight months, sometimes 12 months, depending on the deal, depending on the market fluctuations. Principal and return were protected against the sale or the refinance of the home. So ideally he's getting off, he's getting this, this project off of his hands with a sale, but if the sale price isn't there, he would refinance and pay back the investors. South, South Chicago real estate was depressed, is, still depressed and is getting gentrified uh, is getting going through a regentrification. Uh, Tiger Woods was building a, a golf course out on the south side of Chicago. Um, you know, some of the other things that wasn't in this in this uh, layout here is, you know, I don't know if any of you are from Chicago, but it gets really cold there in the winter time. And so this operation shuts down at certain times of the year. You just can't work outside because it gets so cold. And so the typical buy-in, thirty to sixty thousand, and the investor was updated on the project via email, so you could request uh, pictures or or an update. Now I'm not going to break this down for you any further than I have. I'm just giving you an example of some of the bigger bullet points that you should bring to your forefront when this deal was much more full of documentation and powerpoints and and other and other uh, items to consider. These were some of the core pieces or core aspects that really do the due diligence on the operational side and the asset side of it. So would that be a deal that you would get into? The next one is a self-storage. Uh, this is a, a private group that simply does self-storage. They don't do anything else. They have a, a, some key operators that, that are doing more of the business development, but a full board of, of directors that, that execute on the deals. 15 years of, of private money funding and raising for self-storage. They either make improvements to existing uh, existing self-storage and then get new tenants in, uh, new stuff rather, or they brand new construction. If a site has the viability and what they're looking for, brand new construction. Um, one of the strange things and one of the interesting things about here is very little debt rendering on the property. So if they could, they would raise enough money to buy the property outright. So full equity on the property and then no debt on it until the refinance happens and the investors get paid out. So from an investor standpoint, it's full equity. And so the money, your investment money actually goes into the real estate and not into debt, which is very interesting. The investment was protected, as I just mentioned, by the physical land or by the building. 8% uh, preferred return quarterly payouts. And it was based off of the, the company's cash flow. And this wasn't just this simple product project. This company holds multiple facilities. And so it's based off of the company's cash flow, not just this individual project's cash flow. Now, a big risk mitigating factor is the operator's experience. You know, people have been saying for, for about a year now that self-storage is going to be the next recession hit asset. Um, these these operators uh, were always claiming that they were their experience was going to allow them to surf the wave of recessions just fine. One hundred thousand dollar minimum. Uh, it was a special offering for people that were bringing one million plus. They would receive uh, more of a GP role than an LP role in the in in the project. And then monthly online portal where the investors could log in and they can either uh, talk about the project. They could even certain projects got, hey, well, I want this painted blue. No, I want this painted pink. I want this painted yellow. And then they put it to the vote. And although the company got 51% of the vote, uh, the, the LPs got 49%. So they did weigh heavily into it. And again, it's about the investor experience. These, these folks were professionals. They wanted to treat their investors as if they were truly a part of the project. So again, the past deal, would you have gotten into it knowing what you know now? 
And then lastly, and I'll finish here, this is a, a Georgia movie industry investment. Uh, California producers of an A through C class movies. Uh, Georgia is, uh, Atlanta specifically, but Georgia as a state films more movies than California does nowadays due to the lower income tax and the state offers tax credits to the movie industry. And so these producers coming in from California, anywhere from A to a C class, you, you are awarded tax credits up front with a pro rata equity share of the revenue during the initial launch and then the potential for royalties along the way as uh, you know smaller um, smaller sales come out if they do video games or spin-off shows or cartoons or action figures all those things are specified in the individual movie that you are becoming a producer in you tech some of them even come with a title um, in you get your name in the in the credits as a uh, mini producer now the the movies and this is where some of the risk involves here is the market risk is actually the movie stars themselves now this organization didn't just sell these movies in uh, America you know, Jason Statham is really popular in Europe Mickey Rourke is really popular in Romania you know all of these things that's that is where the the human element the operator element of yes this movie in America is C class but this actor is raising revenue like crazy internationally and that's where these sales were going to be more efficient now that could be more about the return and less about the royalties but again doing your due diligence and understanding all the factors the investors were allowed to choose which production that they were involved in uh, the tax credits up front again when you're using an IRA a self-directed IRA this may not be the option for you because of the tax credits up front with a tax uh, already a tax friendly vehicle um, the lifetime chance for royalties um, can allow you to return your re, uh, recapture your return over the long haul. Uh, the highly competitive market with high risk, got to have good operators behind you. And then uh, updates are provided regularly by multiple sources. If you were invested with a big movie, you know exactly when the movie is coming out because you see uh, trailers and all that good stuff. So, um, the, you know, and again, not to say this was a good or a bad thing, just to lay the facts out and see if this would be something that you, knowing what you know now, would have been involved with. So, uh, and again, I just want to take the time to say thank you, Larissa and the rest of the Advanta team. Um, thank you so much for having me and, and thanks for all those in attendance and all of those who are going to be listening to this on replay. It was an honor to chat with you. Yeah, absolutely. And so a couple questions for you. Um, in your experience, and I know a few of these questions are really going to be case by case, so just really <laughs> in general, um, why do they have a minimum? Let's say, are, is it because they only want to work with a certain number of investors? And I, I think tip, it's very typical to have not only a minimum, but a maximum per individual. So why would they put those restrictions on it? Sure, that's a, that's a wonderful question. So the maximum... And again, it is case by case, but most of the time, the maximum is so not one single investor can have too much say or leverage over the rest of the general partners. When a when a business owner or a syndicator is bringing and doing all the legwork for the deal, they want to have some control or say for the most part of, of their business or their operation. And so when you have someone who's bringing in $2 million that fully funds the deal, that investor is going to assume that they have – near full rights and to, to say what they want done to the project. And so a maximum gives the GPs some level of control or gives the business owner more level uh, leverage or control of, of their own operation or their own investment or business. Now the minimums, the minimums are going to have to do with uh, accreditation of investors. Um, it is to protect the general public. You know, if you could just offer anything to anyone, if you could walk down the street and around your neighborhood and say, hey, give me, you know, five bucks. I'm collecting, you know, money because I'm building an apartment complex a few blocks away. That's what the, the SEC wants to prevent. Um, it is a general public, you know, they love them or hate them. The SEC does really good work to protect uh, the average American because the average American isn't on this webinar right now. They aren't doing self-directed IRAs. They're just out there living their lives and they're investing the way they think. And when something comes along, uh, the SEC had to put regulations in place. And so uh, the $50,000, the $100,000, is it open to non-accredited investors? Is it open to accredited investors? You know, all of those things are for the general public's uh, safety. 
Okay, I got you. And I did have a request um, to go ahead and scroll back to the sure. towards the beginning to show the all the steps on one page. So let me go ahead and do yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Real quick. Um, <clears throat> and while I'm doing that, I also and I want to mention too that Anthony's contact information is going to be on the last slide here. So we'll move up and go to that in just a second. Um, but oops, I jumped too far. There we go. Okay, so there there you are. There's all the steps. Um, and then another question, and again, I know this is going to be case by case, but something like a um, self-directed IRA is, um, you know, the IRS requires valuation on all assets. So if it's, you know, a publicly traded stock, obviously the value of that on any given day, even down to the minute is very easy. But on an annual basis, a self-directed IRA administrator, just like Advanta, is going to require because it's IRS rules, that we have an annual value on an asset in the IRA account. So how do they determine the value? Because a lot of times, let's say you make the investment, you know, of course, it's going to be a lot easier if you make the investment in um, November or December, and then we need the value as of December 31st. But let's say you make the, the investment in March, and here we go, you know, here we come to the end of the year. How would they determine the value, especially because they're you know, very likely at the very beginning of the investment stages at that point. Yeah, of course, in case by case, because of the at the the change in the 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 difference between different industries and different assets, uh, it's it's going to vary. You know, a very simple one for businesses. If you're investing in a business or in a business's product, you can have making sure those operators have teams in place. Like, do you do regular business valuations? I would like those sent to me, please. Mm -hmm. That would give you that would give you some kind of value of the of the asset within the IR and within the IRA um, nearly immediately. Even if it's even if it's a startup company, give me the business valuation. We are worth one. We are worth basically what you gave us. Okay, that's the valuation. Uh, mm -hmm. For for different real estate assets, that could be very easily found. You could talk with a realtor. You could talk with other real estate professionals. You could look up. Uh, general um, price valuations in the area. You can get it appraised a lot of different ways you, you can do that. Um, different things like farmland and everything, I imagine. And again, going back to, um, excuse me, going back to uh, the operators, they should be able to, to tell you what the value is currently, what the value is going to be, and uh, you know, provide you some documentation on uh, what you can, uh, what you can, value your current investment on. So it is certainly going to be case by case, but I'm going to leverage the human capitalist aspect of this. You have to have the right people in place if it's going to be successful. Does that answer your question fully there? Yeah, it does. Um, I appreciate that. I also, um, I did change the slides. I just wanted to make sure I got Anthony's contact information up here before we end the webinar because we were really just about at that point. But I did have one more question pop up. Well, really too, somebody's asking about if they they, they signed on late. Um, it is being recorded. You will get a copy of the recording to your email inbox, the email that you registered with. So that will come to you either um, probably Tuesday of next week um, because Advana is actually closed for Veterans Day on Monday. And then um, another question that popped up was about crowdfunding. And, um, you know, crowdfunding is going to be treated a little bit differently as far as, you know, accredited investors and how much they take and how investments are treated. Did you want to touch on that at all, Anthony? I can certainly talk about it for sure. Uh, and again, crowdfunding platforms are still regulated. Even if you, you can have a syndication that is offered to non-accredited investors, um, you, there's just a lot more paperwork involved with it. So crowdfunding is still uh, still regulated. You know, there are certain hard money crowdfunding platforms, real estate crowd crowdfunding platforms out there that you can invest with. Um, it is still it is still regulated. It is not a bad thing to get involved with. You can spread. If you had a hundred thousand dollars and you could put it into one deal, or you could spread it across maybe five or eight different deals, maybe that quote unquote diversification of that dollars or of that you know, pot of money would offer you a little bit more protection of that would be you building in your own principal protection and you building in your own return protection. But crowdfunding platforms aren't just, hey, I'm raising money now. It 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 is it is very regulated. Um, and it is certainly a good option. And I would say a lot of people that have smaller amounts in their self-directed accounts should look into opportunities uh, with crowdfunding platforms. 
Awesome. Okay. Well, I think that's it. I didn't see any other questions pop up. So I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. But Anthony, I want to thank you again for joining us. That was amazing information. And we're going to get that posted to our website. Everybody on the webinar, thank you so much for attending. And again, you will receive the recording. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you, Larissa. Take care. You too.